An ageing population and huge advances in healthcare mean many Australians face a prolonged and costly death. Now, several Australian states are contemplating voluntary euthanasia bills that will legalise mercy killings of the terminally ill. I'm Drew Ambrose. On this edition of 101 East, we ask if voluntary euthanasia could be the solution for Australians asking for the right to die with dignity. In 1996, Australia's Northern Territory became the first place in the world to legalise voluntary euthanasia, essentially allowing doctors to prescribe suicide to their terminally ill patients. But after nine months, the Australian Federal Government repealed the law and assisting suicide was once again a serious crime. Today, Australians enjoy one of the highest life expectancy rates in the world but advances in health technology that keep people alive longer don't necessarily give them quality of life. I get too bad and I can't do nothing about it and I just got away like a zombie. I want to go when I want to go. Many Australians who fear the prospect of a bleak, medicalised and drawn out death are once again thinking that voluntary euthanasia might be the answer and several state governments are now considering the option. It's a crime in Australia, taboo in many parts of the world, and a political and moral minefield. But poll after poll shows the majority of Australians want voluntary euthanasia legalised. While politicians around the country debate the issue, on the Gold Coast, people are taking matters into their own hands by learning how to end their lives when they no longer feel they're worth living. In Australia, the Gold Coast is referred to as God's waiting room for its higher than average population of retirees. Today, they're out in force at a local community center as they prepare to learn the best and most painless way to kill themselves. You just go to the cupboard where you put this drug that you'd obtained some years back, open the cupboard, drink it down and you'll die. Dr. Philip Nitschke is the head of euthanasia advocacy group Exit International and the first doctor in the world to legally kill his own patient. I've never seen anyone drink the contents of a bottle like that and survive. In 1996, Dr. Nitschke made world headlines by assisting in the suicide of Robert Dent under the full protection of the Northern Territory's new euthanasia laws. These days, he's forced to work on the fringes of the law. While suicide is not a crime in Australia, anyone assisting a suicide can face a lengthy jail term. Dr. Nitschke is throwing down the gauntlet to the authorities by running suicide workshops for the elderly and the infirm. And while we're on dangerous gases, I should mention by way of completion, the very cheap and nasty method, which is known as the detergent death, here for the pricely sum of uh, $10, you can come back with all of the ingredients for detergent suicide. Very effective, but dangerous to everyone else, and of course it stinks. The question is always the same that's asked in the polls. If you're suffering, no hope of recovery, do you think you should be able to have access to lawful help from a doctor to die? 80% will say yes, but that still hasn't translated at this point in time to legislative change. To avoid prosecution, Dr. Nitschke provides only advice on how people can take their own lives. But today he's also selling some new do-it-yourself suicide equipment. This is a nitrogen cylinder. When used in a particular way with an exit bag, you would be able to end your own life in a few minutes peacefully, reliably, it doesn't fail. His system uses nitrogen canisters normally associated with brewing beer and a special head covering that exit members make at home. Well, this method of bag making is very simple. Uh, we've chosen a large size oven bag, mainly because that fits all size heads. If you want to look nice, you better go and get your hair done because this does mess your hair up. It's not a mechanical obstruction of breathing, like hanging or head under water or pillow pushed into someone's face where you mechanically can't breathe, they are terrifying deaths. 
there's a precipitous drop in the oxygen level and you faint immediately and you'll die very shortly thereafter, but you're deeply unconscious. You're a very courageous man. Oh, really? Now, exit members are generally elderly. The average age of our membership is 75. Mostly they're people that simply know that they're not always going to be well and they want to know what their choices are should their circumstances deteriorate. And so they come along wanting to know what their options might be if their situation were to worsen or if they were to become ill in the future. People in my age group want to be able to digress. Dying doesn't scare me at all, but living and not being able to do things that I want to do, that does scare me. I've got um, scoliosis, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, fibromyalgia, arachnoiditis and a few others. So it's going to be a painful death. There's no way I'm going into a nursing home where I'm lying there like a vegetable. Um, when a certain time comes in my life and I think I can't handle it anymore, I'm certainly going to make sure that that's the way I go. I'm not going to burden my children, I'm not going into a nursing home. My criteria are very broad. I think that if a person is of sound mind and an adult, they deserve access to the best information. I don't there are too many lines, the lines that I've just indicated, not for children and not for the mentally unwell. But there's an oven in there. And you he says about his workshops that you need to be 50 to attend. There have been cases where people younger than that have got access to his information online and have taken their lives. Paul Russell is the founder of an anti-euthanasia organisation called HOPE and an active member of the Right to Life movement. We have a significant problem in youth suicide in Australia and I really wonder at this terrible mixed message about, you know, we're trying to stop young people from suiciding but at the same time we're actually willing to dispose of, of people at the end of life. Uh, that is a very, very mixed message and I think it's a very dangerous mixed message. Paul is up the stakes in an ongoing battle with Dr. So Nitschke. He reported Philip to the Australian Medical Board in an attempt to have him deregistered as a doctor and pronounced unfit to practice medicine. Why did I do it? Principally because I saw it as a, a great issue of public safety. There are no guarantees about who buys these kits. We don't just don't know what happens when people access these things and what they actually use them for and whom they use them upon. Well, I, Paul's upset about the fact that we developed a nitrogen system which allows everyone to have a peaceful, reliable, legal and, interestingly, undetectable death. I am being targeted and clearly uh, there are some people in our society who want to see me certainly unemployed and I suppose more of them, so many of them would like to see me in prison. Now. What do I mean by undetectable? You say, well, hang on, what do you mean undetectable? I'm lying there, I've got a cylinder of gas, bag over my head, and someone says, I don't know how he died of lung cancer. Come on. <laughs> but if someone takes all that stuff away and then calls a doctor, there's nothing to see. There's no sign, there's no trace, and even at autopsy, there's nothing to find. We need to think about what it means to be undetectable. Well, firstly, as a marketing pitch, I don't think it's really hard to imagine someone who's got an, an aged or ailing relative who's just in the way of thinking, well, you know, maybe I could get a hold of a nitrogen kit and um, deal with grandma and nobody will ever know. The current uh, ageing baby boomers are reasonably well cashed up, um, they have a lot of resources and there are unscrupulous relatives, carers, etc., that are taking advantage of people like that. A resident of the South Australian capital, Adelaide, Paul has personal reasons for lobbying local MPs to stop a stream of euthanasia bills from gaining traction in the state parliament. He's concerned that legalising euthanasia could lead to the mistreatment of vulnerable people like his own son. Joseph's 12 years old now, he has Down syndrome. He's a, a wonderful, wonderful addition to our family and really brings life to us in some amazing ways. But I do recall one person came straight out, they sort of said, couldn't you have done something about that? And I thought that was pretty shocking, but I thought, well, you know, maybe people do think like that. Oh, great stuff. That's the one. If there is euthanasia and assisted suicide legislation, people like Joseph might be at additional risk of abuse. In Belgium at the moment, they're debating whether or not to allow people with Alzheimer's uh, to have access to euthanasia. I think there may already be a bill in the parliament to look at allowing euthanasia for teenagers and also for uh, newborns with disabilities. Some people will be euthanised without their request or consent and that vulnerable people will in fact be at risk. 
Once we have created an effective right to die by a piece of legislation, the arguments for stopping it from being extended to others basically disappear. The term euthanasia is derived from the Greek word meaning a good death. While the Australian public debates what that means for them, Dr. Philip Nitschke continues a campaign of civil disobedience, informing Australians of their end-of-life choices while being careful to stay on the right side of the law. Dear Dr. Nitschke, ever since my husband passed away from a massive coronary, I've been a supporter. I've read all your articles and I'm hoping you can inform me of what I can take to just go to sleep when I'm ready. She sounds so nice, she deserves a reply. I'll try and get a reply off today. Our office is pretty much on the road many times because of course the people that I see invariably are too sick to travel. We're off to see Daryl Crick, he's terminally ill now and he's person who wants to have this choice, the choice of being able to end his life at the time of his choosing. Good on you. I know a little bit about it because you've told me on the phone, but just let's go through it. You found yourself quite ill. They took all my lymph nodes out of there, nine out of there, six out of there, and I was going around me tendons and me shoulders. Yeah. So they took them out in 2008. And in 2011, I couldn't swallow and they put a peg in and they found it come back in my sarcophagus and there's nothing I can do, basically go home and just wait to go home and die. Well, as you know, it's illegal to try and obtain a drug, which is Nembutel. It's yeah, the best of the drugs, but you can get it as long as you know what you're doing. So I guess what I can do, which may be of help, is that I can tell you about how you can go about it. First thing I've got to do is I've got to get you to sign a disclaimer because it's part of this whole process. The law says that you can end your own life, but you don't break any laws. But no one can help you, which is why I can't give you the drugs. Now, I'm in a sense going to help you because I'm going to tell you what you might be able to do, but because I'm not physically going to help you, that's my protection, you see. But what I'm also going to do is to get you to sign this bit of paper here which basically says your name, your address, where you live, and it says here that I'm going to take no notice of any of the information provided at this visit. In other words, you're going to ignore everything I say, which is stupid, stupid, but we'll get you to sign it. Thank you. Daryl is no stranger to the legalities of euthanasia. In 2002, his mother Nancy challenged Queensland state law when she chose to take her own life surrounded by close friends, family and supporters. 21 people risked life imprisonment for being present at her death, though no charges were ever laid. Dr. Nitschke advised Nancy on the drugs she could take to end her suffering and her life, and now he's doing exactly the same for her son. Now it'll be a white powder. It dissolves in water. Now you're lucky in one sense, because you're having trouble swallowing because of the way the cancer's spread, you've got a peg and just pump it straight in to your gut and you'll go to sleep very quickly. I would say within a few minutes. So if you're gonna have a final drink, be it beer or maybe something a bit stronger, yeah. maybe some rum. fundy rum, <laughs> you'll be able to sip on that rum and you won't get long. Oh, well, but it'll be a damn good rum to sip on. Okay, we'll be all right. And, and, you'll, and you'll just go to sleep. Oh, yeah, like my mum. Yeah, exactly yeah. like your mum did. It's the most peaceful of deaths. Yeah, so now I feel a lot better. I don't have to worry about nothing when the time comes. I'll have me milk and go off to Disneyland. Terminally ill patients may no longer need to sidestep the law if they want to end their own lives. In Tasmania, Parliament is responding to public pressure and the island state could be on the verge of legalising voluntary euthanasia. We are actually a very progressive state. 80% is a, an overwhelming level of community support and it really makes the argument that it's time that Parliament's caught up with community opinion on this issue. Nick McKim is the leader of the Tasmanian Greens Party 
and the co-sponsor of a voluntary euthanasia bill currently making its way through the state's parliamentary process. I think that the law has to catch up with what we know is occurring in palliative care wards right around Australia as we speak, which is that people are being euthanised, sometimes uh, without their permission, but often with their permission, uh, without legal frameworks or safeguards in place to make sure that it's being done appropriately. Pro-euthanasia groups are confident the Tasmanian Parliament will legalise voluntary euthanasia within the next 12 months. Mr Speaker, it is disappointing and frustrating. It's no longer an issue on the political fringe and the proposed legislation has the full backing of State Premier Laura Giddings. People will have the choice. If people don't want to use this framework, then they simply can choose not to use it. Under our models, doctors will not be able to sort of hawk or sell uh, voluntary assisted dying to patients. It would have to be raised in the first instance by patients. We want to make sure it's truly voluntary, but we want to make sure that to the best of our capacity, we can reduce the kind of unnecessary suffering and the unnecessary loss of dignity, which tragically uh, so many Australians currently face towards the end of their lives. The most vociferous opposition seems to come from organised church groups, particularly the Australian Christian Lobby. This reform is based on values like compassion and respect for human dignity. And I don't see any conflict between Christianity and voluntary assisted dying, and in fact, neither do many Christians. The Catholic Church in Tasmania is alerting its parishes and schools to the fundamental ethical principles involved, and of course taking advantage of living in a democracy and putting its point of view in the public square. Father Michael Tate is a former Australian Federal Minister for Justice turned Catholic priest. The fact is that the death penalty was done away with partly because we were afraid that faulty evidence accepted by a jury could lead to the hanging of an innocent person. You can't take the risk of one person being unjustly put to death. And it's the same with euthanasia. I don't think it is possible to draft legislation with foolproof safeguards. With the best will in the world, doctors may make an incorrect diagnosis of a terminal illness, or they may not recognise the vulnerability of a particular person to emotional pressure from family and friends, for example. The gastrostomy isn't as urgent as it looked maybe a week or so ago, but I think it's probably still worth having. I mean, we can talk some more about it if you like. Well, I have been a practitioner of palliative care now for about 25 years. It's care for the dying, care for the people with advanced terminal illness. And euthanasia doesn't sit very comfortably with palliative care for those people who practice palliative care. Professor Ian Maddox has devoted his life to caring for the terminally ill and is a former Australian of the Year. Euthanasia is about helping people to die. And we could say palliative care is about helping people to live until they die. Our job is not to either lengthen life or shorten life. We are trying to help life be good. Eddie, that they say that you're having a bit more trouble swallowing. To turn it around and say, we want to give people the right to take their own lives is a rather different approach. The difficulty is trying to get that quite right and get legislation which is appropriate for that. We might have to put some of the medication under your skin rather than make you swallow it. I'll have a look and see if we can change it over a bit. You may find that in certain jurisdictions that have um, euthanasia, they say you must have a disease which is going to kill you itself in, in, in six months. Well, I can't tell whether people are going to live less than six months very often. Sometimes you can say certainly they're going to live less than six months, but sometimes, I don't know, they may go on for a year or more. And are they eligible for euthanasia? We've got a definition that says six months. Makes it very difficult. And people with chronic diseases, people with dementia, people who are just getting very old and sick of it all, they are the ones who are beginning to say, we want to think about ending our lives. Probably the one area in which we clearly treat animals better than humans is that if they are suffering and we know that they're not going to recover, we take them to a vet and we provide euthanasia for them. 
Peter Singer is Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University and an influential moral philosopher. The author of provocative titles such as Killing Humans and Killing Animals is speaking to a packed house in Melbourne. It's okay for doctors to let nature take its course, to allow someone to die without treating them, but uh, heaven forbid that they should heed their requests for voluntary active euthanasia and actually give them an injection that will end their suffering. Peter Singer's views on euthanasia courted controversy when he suggested that spending money to keep a terminally ill patient alive might be morally wrong if that money could be better spent finding a cure for cancer. Well, I think the clearest case where euthanasia is justifiable is undoubtedly with the consent of a well-informed, mentally competent person. I also think there can be cases of people who were never capable of giving consent, for example, a, a baby born with a very severe disability, where one might feel that the suffering of that infant or, and of the child, if the child lives, will be so great and the prospects for a meaningful life will be so poor that euthanasia could be justified then. I think a good way of testing what the effect of changing the law about voluntary euthanasia is likely to be is to look at those countries that have already done it. I mean, this is not some new idea that nobody has put into effect. Uh, in the Netherlands, they've had the open practice of voluntary euthanasia for more than 20 years. The population there is overwhelmingly supportive. The best person to decide when a human life is not worth living is the person whose life it is. The second best situation is where you've had a thorough discussion with them beforehand of would they like to live in a condition like this? And then they might say, well, you know, if, if it reached this point, I wouldn't want to live. I hope we don't ever get to a stage in Australia where doctors are licensed to kill. I have tried to stop um, voluntary euthanasia legislation. I've always hung on to life. We are programmed genetically to want to live, not to want to die. John Moxon is an anti-euthanasia campaigner and a former race car driver who became a quadriplegic during a car crash in 1970. I lost control and the car crashed backwards into a concrete wall and my neck was broken. The next five months I spent in hospital and rehabilitation learning to live with my now limited mobility. Well, I remember quite clearly saying, well, if I had an accident and that happened to me, I'd rather not survive. I don't think I, for one moment, um, have not wanted to live because of my spinal cord injury. So if people have a view in their minds of what it's like to have a severe disability or to be in a nursing home uh, where they you know, are looked after by other people, and they see that as worse than dying. So it's, it's a combination of ignorance and a knowledge, because they've visited their grandparents or their parents in a nursing home, of how horribly we treat old people in nursing homes. I have a very strong belief that as a, as a species, our way forward is by working with and supporting each other, not getting rid of the ones that are weakest in the tribe. I just fear that once the legislation is in, hate to use the term, but there is a slippery slope. If suddenly you are, you are a person considered to have a life not worth living, how much effort are people going to put into keeping you alive? I find that challenging thought and I, it scares me. Well, a good death for me would be to be um, surrounded by family and friends, preferably somebody holding my hand. For some it might mean doing the ultimate bucket list and, and dying satisfied you've done everything you wanted to do in life. A good death is a death whereby we have uh, a level of control over the timing of our death. I think to die of a heart attack, uh, something like that, at a, at a ripe old age when I was doing something that I enjoyed doing would be a good way to go. What I do know is that I want choice. I also know that I've actually got choice, so I'm fortunate. With courage, love, patience around you, uh, do it well. A good death is being beaten to death at the age of 95 by a jealous husband.